Thank you for accommodating my uh, uh, change in schedule. Um, first of all, welcome to everyone here. I'm glad to see so many people are excited about emergency medicine. Um, I hope people left because I actually needed a break and not because the word research scares them. But <laughs> that sort of gets to my uh, first point. So just before I start, I just want to make a couple of points about the presentations that were made earlier. Um, everything those other speakers said is like, those are like written in gold. Like those are very, very valuable points one for one. Because I can still tell you, as an attending, and um, I'm also, I also interview residents for, um, I mean, I interview med students for our residency application process. And you will not believe the importance of small things. You say, oh, one little bad interaction. It's like, oh, you know, yeah, I said something about someone. It happens. It all gets back, and it all matters. We have a highly qualified pool of candidates, and we need to choose within those the best of the best. So it matters. And you don't need to be, um, you don't need to be neurotic or overly anxious about it. You just have to be aware of yourself and realize what's appropriate and what's not. Um, the other thing, just one more freebie before I start talking about research, is you guys have no idea how important it is just to show up to your shift on time. Like, no matter how smart you are, how many papers you've published, if you come to your shift 20 minutes late, that, that you've pretty much like, especially if it's just like one observation shift, you, you've done yourself a lot of harm. So, especially the first shift, you know, you're not sure to get there, where to park and all that, you know, maybe come in a day earlier like was suggested. I mean, it, it's unbelievable how important that is just to show up on time. A little piece of advice for people who do end up in a situation that's frustrating, because it happens a lot, and this I've sort of learned myself the hard way, is just write an email. Don't put anything in the address line so that it will not be sent by mistake. And write everything you think. Write to the closure director and say, your residents are condescending. Your attendings are terrible. Your nurses are passive aggressive. Write it all. And then never send it. And then I'm sure I can promise you 99% of the cases, when you go back the next day, you'll say, wow. I really was angry yesterday, and I feel much better today, and this email is going just where it belongs, which is in the trash can. If anything actually untoward happens, you are harassed in some way, you are not treated respectfully, those things can be brought up in the proper form. But a lot of times, these sort of minor things can really build up, especially if you're working nights, and you're working long hours, and you're away from your home, and these things can build up, and it's really a good idea just to write it down. If you need to send it to someone, send it to your mom or your friend back in medical school. But it's really helpful just to write all this stuff down. And I, for a while when I was a resident, every shift was full of aggravation. And I'd write it all in an email. And initially, I would send them to my program director until I realized what a bad idea that was. And I just started deleting them. And um, that's, uh, that's uh, s one way to deal with the stress that you may, you may encounter. And um, that's one way of showing to the program director that you're mature and not going to cause trouble by not forwarding them all of your medical place. So now we'll get on to research. Um, I think that sort of the, the first question to be asked is, in this forum, I mean, what is the role of research in medicine in general is a very large question. I'm sure you guys didn't come to this forum to get an answer to that. <laughs> um, you probably want to know what is the role of research in getting into an emergency medicine residency, right? That's probably the reason that, that you guys came here. Um, I was going to speak about that last, but I realized that's probably the main reason you're here, so we'll sort of uh, <laughs> jump to the end, then, then we'll backtrack a little bit about research in general. Um, as one of the former speakers said, it is not the most important thing, okay? It can be used as a tiebreaker. There are many benefits to what research can do for you. Um, unless you're going to a very, very academic program and you maybe know the faculty there have mentored you in the past, or you're from that institution, and they really have their eye on you as like a future research star, it really is not as important as you may think it is. Um, so it's important to put it in perspective, okay? as you decide to utilize your limited time in your second and third year of medical school, how much do you want to spend doing research and how much do you want to spend improving your board scores, getting an outstanding slow, honoring in whatever important rotations you have to be in. So that's sort of a, an unfortunate way to begin my talk, but it is the truth. I don't want to give you guys like the wrong impression about what to focus on. However, there are many, many positive things that can be used from your research endeavors um, in the application process. One is, of course, just the CV line. You know, a more full CV just looks better. And you don't really get to send in your proper CV because it's all in the ERAS format. But there, there's a line for research, you know, and you can fill it up. And there's, it's just good to have more things on the CV. So it's definitely good to have those. But the caveat of that is please don't put things in your CV that you don't know anything about. People have done that, you know. They were like, you know, volunteered one afternoon in some microbiology lab and put it down as an experience. Then you ask them, 
in the interview. So tell me about um, when you were doing this, uh, you know, CRISPR analysis for the uh, for the mitochondria of the frog, and they're like, uh, that was a while ago. So that that doesn't look good. So if it's not something that you can t talk about confidently and precisely describe what the question was, what the findings were, what your role was in the project, if you can't answer those three questions, just leave it off the CV. It's going to do you more harm than good. Like just having a row, a list of random stuff that you don't really know to say much about is probably not worth it. Um, but on the other hand, if it is a project that you were engaged in, that you understand what the question was, you understand what the results were, mm -hmm. and you can clearly describe what you did and how that helped move the project forward, that's great. Um, and then there's a question, um, so those, those, are the, those are the things um, during, your, during your interview. Another couple of things is oftentimes, you know, you're sitting there for an interview for 30 minutes or 20 minutes, that's like a conversation starter, right? Um, that's something to talk about. You know, we have a lot of people that we interview and we ask them about their hobbies and why they like emergency medicine. The questions begin to get repetitive at some point. And it's good if someone has a, a research interest that they can actually talk about. They can talk about, especially if they can talk about it in a coherent manner and they can describe, you know, what they did and as I talked earlier. Another way, another thing that research can be very helpful is if one of the people interviewing you has research in the same area. Um, that's definitely make a personal connection that way. Uh, beyond that, you can even use research. I define it as glue, just a way to make a connection, okay? If you've like, if your mentor, just someone who you've gone out for with coffee, that's one thing. But if you've actually worked on their projects, you've presented an abstract for them, um, you've done all that work, then they will be more likely to promote you. And this was something I learned in this conference from another talk. There's a difference between a mentor and a promoter. Have you guys heard these terms? So a mentor is someone who promotes you to yourself, which is important, but a promoter is someone who talks you up to other people. So if you have a mentor who's giving you good advice, that's very important, but if you have a promoter who's someone who you've worked with in research or someone who you've worked with clinically or has become your, your emergency medicine mentor, and they talk about you to other people, such as program directors, other programs, they make those connections for you, that is even more helpful. And one way of turning someone from a mentor to a promoter is helping them with their work and engaging in their actual research. Um, so those are, as th those are some of the ways that the research can be used in a, as, a, um, as the utility of the research project in getting into residency. So a little bit about uh, why research is, is important in general in terms of, of emergency medicine and what you guys can do with that. Um, I think it's pretty important to, if you're going, if you do have any aspirations to, let me define this correctly, if you have any aspirations to think systematically about what you do, then it's very helpful to have a background in having done some sort of um, measurable outcome research, right? To have some kind of experience in measuring outcomes in a systematic way, quantitative or qualitative, you know, there's numerous, numerous methodologies, but it's not only the people who are going to end up presenting here at SAM as attendings who need to do research. I think it's m recognized more and more that a, some experience in research is valuable for everyone because everyone at some point in their career is going to ask these questions. What is my department doing? What am I doing? How can we improve it? And even if you're in a community hospital that, you know, you may never publish a paper, but still someone's going to say at one point, are we doing too many head CTs? And the methods you're experiencing, you're, uh, the methods that you're exposed to and that you learn during pretty much any kind of proper research will help you at that point. How do I define a question? How do I choose the right method to answer it? How do I collect my results? How do I make an inference? Are those results important? Do those results actually mean anything? Do those results show um, that our intervention worked, et cetera, depending on what the question is? So I would recommend um, many, many medical schools now have required research curriculum. Um, so that's great. If not, it's also, you know, obviously medical students reach out to faculty and obviously, you know, want to um, volunteer and do different kinds of projects. So another reason to do it, if you are planning an academic career, it's always good to get started early. Um, I'd say mainly for the reason of knowing what, what you want to do, knowing what your focus is. Um, a lot of times the research you publish during your, the abstracts you present, maybe you get a, your name on a paper during medical school, those things will not define your career. However, those things can, can give you an idea of what you enjoy doing and what you don't enjoy doing. And then as you complete residency and you're planning on your next step as an academic emergency physician, 
um, you'll have more of an idea and you'll at least have some basic familiarity with the language of how we write research, how we perform research, and that will, um, that will get you a step forward. So that's a reason to uh, focus on it. It is possible to do some limited amount of research during residency, but it's very difficult. If you do want to do anything before you become um, faculty or an attending yourself, medical school is um, usually a good time to start. Um, so I think those are the, let me see if there's anything else on my list here. Um, yeah, so those are, those are the, um, the, I think those are the, un, so another, another important reason to expose yourself to research during medical school um, is to learn about critical thinking. And this is very important. Um, first of all, as an emergency physician, you're often faced with these very same questions. How do I make a statistic inference about a patient without, with incomplete knowledge, right? And people don't always frame it that way, but that's what you're doing. When you look at a 42-year-old with chest pain, you're taking a lot of statistical assumptions and you're making a statistical, you're, you're, you're developing what we call a pretest probability. And familiarity with statistics and critical thinking will help, I think it will help your career as an emergency physician. Beyond that, and probably more important in some ways, is learn how to critically read an article. Having written articles yourself will teach you some of the shortcuts that people use and will familiarize yourself with the, again, the buzzwords, the typically used statistical terms, and it will make you a much better consumer of medical knowledge. Because as you guys know, not only is the amount of medical knowledge is increasing, the rate of change um, of within medical practice is also increasing. So there's a velocity. Our practice is changing faster and faster. The amount of knowledge is growing faster and faster. And it becomes incumbent upon almost every practicing physician to be able to assimilate knowledge. And ideally, we can do that in a critical way. We don't need to be spoon-fed by guidelines or by like, you know, these uh, podcasts or whatever. Those are good. But really, I think it's a goal, and it should be a goal by the end of medical school, but not everyone has that, but at least you can learn during residency. When a new piece of information comes out, how can I assess that in a critical way, and how can I understand what does that mean for my practice? What does that mean for my patients? What can I actually do with this new paper that came out? Um, you know, thrombolysis for stroke of unknown downtime with an MRI. So there's all these very specific questions and you need to be able to understand because there are a lot of different manipulations that can be done with the data and if you're not familiar with doing research yourself, you're sort of limited in how much you can really understand and criticize the uh, conclusions as they're presented. So those are some reasons why it's important to engage in research. Um, so the different types of research that medical students can engage in. So first of all, who here has like a CV line? Are we done? Two minutes, okay. Who here has like a, a CV line? that has research in it for in their application? Great. Oh, good. So you guys are all on board. Um, so as you guys probably have noticed, um, a lot of times what medical students do is you take data that's existing and you help write the abstract or you help download data or you help collect data in surveys. Um, some people volunteer with very active departments in clinical studies. We do that in our department. We have medical students who volunteer. They come for a summer um, and they're just like every day down in the department uh, collecting data. There is basic science research. That's a little bit less relevant as you aim towards emergency medicine, unless, again, you have a very specific uh, career pathway in basic science. Um, and then, honestly, there's a lot of scholarly activity that can be done, not pure research, but writing things, writing review articles, writing, um, writing blog posts, working on podcasts, things like that, which is becoming more and more common. And if you have a mentor who does that, that's a really great way to get your foot in the door. So the last thing I was gonna say is timing. I understand everyone, almost everyone here is the end of third year. Yeah, okay, so it might be, those of you who have not done research, you're really up against the deadline, unless you have something in the, in the, pipe, in the pipeline that's going to be published soon. Um, it's getting a little late, um, but as you advise the junior classmen who come to you for advice, tell them to get on board of the research as soon as possible. Because you want anything to go on your application, it needs to be done by the summer of your third year, right? So that's the time. I have a lot of medical students who approach me at about this time, like, Dr. Brody, I want to do research, and I tell them, you know, it's a little late, okay? Um, so there's one more thing that I would also recommend thinking about, and it's not too late for you guys. There are grants for medical students. EMRA has a $5,000 grant. Um, EMF, Emergency Medicine Foundation, most years has a medical student grant. Often the medical school itself or the emergency medicine department will have a small grant. So not only does that money enable you to have some time, maybe instead of working during the summer or instead of doing something else, you have that time, it gives you time. Sometimes you could even use the money 
to pay for things that you need for your research, if you need some kind of assay or some kind of advanced analysis. Um, but not only that the money gives you more opportunities, receiving the grant itself is another thing on your CV that looks really good. So I'd recommend people who are seriously interested in doing research look into those opportunities to have the research not only done, but to have it funded. Um, and again, that's, so that's, that's the advice. And I think that's it. If you have any other questions, I'll be around. Um, and I will um, uh, give you guys my email as well. So thanks a lot. Great.